themes in the Old Testament. You know, we're going to stick with that same lesson idea. This week I want to talk about covenants that were in the Old Testament. You know, there was the, the newest and most prolific covenant when Jesus came down to save us through, through his, for our, save us for our sins through him dying on the cross. But there are five others that are in the New Testament, the Old Testament, that sometimes get overlooked. Or sometimes you read through the story, you read through the details, that you're not quite understanding what that actually is. You know, a covenant is, in a biblical sense, means a conditional promise made to humanity by God. The five major covenants in the Old Testament are the Adamic, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, and David, David. These covenants were named after the individuals which covenants were made. This lesson is to show some of the covenants being fulfilled to this day. There were, all these covenants were made to four extremely or five extraordinary individuals that followed his commands or, or believed in the faith. Except for Adam. We all know the, the um, story that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. They ate from the, the forbidden fruit. Well, they disobeyed God's command, so they had to be punished. But if we go back to Genesis 3, verses 14 through 19, we'll read the very first um, guidelines and through that first covenant made. Um, 3... Verses 14 through 19. Let's start there. It says, The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and thus you shall eat all the days of your life. I put an enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband's, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth for you. It shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For you are dust, and dust you shall return. Now I stated in these five verses that this covenant was given to three individuals. The serpent, Adam, and Eve. This covenant was made because Adam and Eve disobeyed the the one command they had at that time from God. And they all ultimately had to suffer the consequences, which we're still suffering today. For disobeying what God had commanded, he punished all three. He said, this covenant will be passed down and it will be all be remembered. See, if you turn further into Genesis 5, verses 1 through 32, you can see Adam's bloodline laid out of who begot who. A whole verse 30, 31 or 32 verses, you'll see that who begot who all the way down through the generations. But the particular verse I want to look at is in Genesis 5, verse 28 and 29. It says, When Lamech, who had lived 182 days, 182 years, not days, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. Now this is generations. This is years and years down the road that they're still suffering because of that first the covenant that God had made with Adam. You know, he said, Cursed will be the ground and you will work it. Well, they still remember that you still have to work the ground. You see, the covenant never goes away. 
You know, it's even mentioned in the New Testament in the book of Romans. And if we read Romans 8, 22 through 23, it also makes mention of them toiling in the ground. It says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together of the pains of childbirth until now. So not only is it going to show that Adam's part of the covenant is there, it's still showing that Eve's part of the covenant is there too because of the, the pain of childbirth. Going on, it says, Not only the creation, but we ourselves. Who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, redemptions of our bodies. You know, in today's time, farmers are still having to work the ground to get corn or whatever, um, peanuts, watermelons, things of that nature. The equipment has gotten better with tractors and all the GPS tracking and all that. That has gotten better, but the method is still the same. You still have to work the ground to get the fruits that you reap. You know, moving on to that second covenant, the Noahic, Noahic covenant. You know, we mentioned in, that, in the Genesis 5 there, when Lamech said who had his birth son of Noah, that would be the actual start of his, the, the start of his, his covenant. Now Noah's covenant didn't come until after the rain of 40 days and 40 nights. He done built the ark and been called crazy and everything else. But the verses that actually repeat and actually state Noah's covenant was in Genesis um, 8, 20 through, ver through chapter 9 and 17. But the particular verses we're going to look at here is in Genesis 8, 20 through 21. And this is going to come after the flood has happened. They have done open the doors. They are back on dry land. Genesis 8, 21, or 20 states, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took, of, took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and burnt offerings and burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I had done. So right there, God had given the, the second covenant known to man. He had said that he would never flood the earth and never kill every living thing on, on the planet. Like all covenants, the covenant with Noah and with all the creation had a sign. This sign was that of the rainbow. You know, you see that pretty little thing. You don't want to see but half of it. Sometimes you see two. But that was the God's promise. That was his reminder to creation that he would never again flood the earth. I think what is significant about that actual sign, because if you look at it, it's, it's a rainbow. It's like the upside down of a compound bow and it says the is the warrior's bow at rest God who had drawn drawn his bow of judgment his arrow of judgment against the world had now set it down for a time being so that salvation can be accomplished so he essentially promised that he wouldn't he would do that again moving on to the third covenant was that Abrahamic covenant. Now this is most widely known and this is actually pretty um, significant. You know, God comes to Abram at this time and says, hey, you know, pick up your stuff, everything that you own, take your wife and leave. Go to a whole other place and I'll fix and give to you. You know, that's kind of like how you keep the youngs out of the house when it's their time to get out. They're going to graduate high school. They don't know where they're going. But this covenant was made to Abram in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. See, as we read the, the three 
portions or the three points made in this covenant that there was there are different examples all throughout Old Testament of how these covenants, these promises were actually fulfilled and coming to pass in different parts. Reading Genesis 12, verse 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be a blessing through you. So that first point, he's going to say, I'm going to give you, I'm going to multiply you. You know, I'm going to give you peoples. I'm going to give you land. I'm also going to give you blessings. So of those three, those are going on through the Old, through the New Old Testament and Psalms and Deuteronomy and all them different uh, different books. You know, and God made this covenant with Abraham as an act of grace. Abraham was instructed to leave his homeland and follow God wherever God led him to. This covenant was passed down through three generations. Abraham, his son Isaac, and then Jacob, which is Isaac's son, which is Abraham's grandson, begot, begot, begotten. But all three were promised land, many descendants, and blessings from the Lord. Abraham was to train his family to do what was right and to uphold the, his end of the agreement of this covenant with an act called circumcision. This details of the covenant is, descri is described in Genesis 17, 9 through 14. But there are many more examples of the covenant that extend further into the Old Testament. For example, you turn over to Psalms, one of the, the biggest book in the entire Bible. You turn to Psalms 105, verses 6, six through 11, and in it, it talks about one of the three points that were made in Genesis 12. Psalms 105, 6 through 11 reads, O offspring, right there, right at the beginning, it says offspring, of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen one. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all are in all of the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, the sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give you the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. So in there, not only does he talk about the offspring, he talks about that, that the covenant that was made, but also talks about the land. You know, right there at the end, it says land of Canaan as your portion. So not only is one, but two other covenants way back in the beginning, Genesis, are mentioned in the middle of the Old Testament and Psalms. Another example of the, this Abrahamic covenant, we turn to Isaiah chapter 27, verses 12 and 13. Isaiah 27, 12 and 13 says, And that day... From the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain, and it will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, the great trumpet will be blown, and those who are lost in the land of Syria and those who are driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. No, it said one day we will be blessed and that we will rise up to worship the Lord on high. The fourth um, example of the covenant of the covenants is the Mosaic covenant. You now this covenant was made actually for the people of the nation of Israel through Moses in Exodus, the chapters 19 and 20 through 24. 
No, Jesus, God had used Moses to help deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt and out of the life of slavery that they'd been. I think it was like 400 years they'd been slaves to Egypt. It's quite a long time to be a slave. God had promised to make Israel his holy nation. His terms of the relationship were set, and the term, but this time the terms were different. You know, with Abraham, the terms for Abraham's covenant was that Abraham had to believe. He had to believe that God was in control. He was going to believe everything God ever told him to do. But God is saying that in having saved you, talking about Israel, I want you to live like my people. I want you to live in such a way that people can tell that you are my people and that you will be bring glory to my name. And so... And in this fashion, he lays out the Ten Commandments. We talked about last week of the Ten Commandments coming down from Mount Sinai. The first version was broke, so he had most of to get the second version. But in the rest of the book of Exodus goes on, these Ten Commandments or terms are expanded in a lot more detail. Not to go on all that because that's another, another lesson for another time. At the end of the book of Exodus, we see what happens, and in the book of Deuteronomy, when they find on the edge of going into the promised land, it is said that people will need to declare the promises and the curses of the covenant. The nation of Israel is commanded to obey the terms given at Mount Sinai, and God also promised to bring blessings to them if they followed his commands, but curses if they disobeyed. So as always, we got good with bad. If you tell you you listen to what you're being told to, you, you'd be on the straight now. It's a good thing to do. It's like listen to your mom and dad. They tell you to do something. You might not want to do that because such and such happens. Well, you know, us youngins, Seth, um, <laughs> know that we know better, so we go and do that thing anyway. And guess what? What exactly what they happens or a version of what they said happened becomes true because they have more experience and also that we need to need to listen to our elders. Sometimes don't listen to brother talking about that. He, I don't know about him. He was off sketchy. But if you look in Deuteronomy twenty, verse fifteen, it actually will tell you in there that the curses and that were or punishments if they disobeyed, which was given to him on Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy twenty fifteen says. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, or be careful to do all of his commandments and the statutes that I commanded you today, then all this curse shall come down upon you and overtake you. You know, as we talked last week, one of the, um, was the golden calf, you know, and uh, was it Asherah? Asherah was the one they had built for the, the Canaanite god. You know, it says there that they were driven out of Israel because they continued to do what they were told not to do. You know, that was right there for them, Deuteronomy 28, 15 coming to play right then. You know, they disobeyed, so they had to have consequences for that. And the final covenant that I want to talk tonight about is the David covenant. You know, God establishes this covenant with David, the son of Jesse. God promised to make David king over Israel and that David's name would be great. God gave David a royal kingdom and his kingdom fulfilled the promises made to Abram through his lineage. This covenant was fulfilled due to the nation of Israel wanting a king. You know, they said, give us a king, give us a king, but they didn't want to have the king that God was going to give. They wanted a king of other nations. We said last week they wanted to be like everybody else around them. So they're known as Saul. What you know, Saul had his flaws, big flaws, but they wanted a king. So God gave them a king, not the one that they wanted or they, they needed, they gave them what they wanted. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and was originally wanted to be king by Samuel. Prophet Samuel. But you know, Saul had failed to obey God, so God rejected him. 
He told Samuel to go tell him that you are no longer need to be king. You are now ex-king. But if you turn, if you read there in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 16, we read how God then chooses David from the tribe of Judah. And if you continue tracing all the way back through his granddad and his granddad, it comes back to being the sons of um, Isaac and and all that. So it continues through the lineage of God's covenants, continue on blessing them with, with kings and with nations. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 16, it's a little one, so we're going to read through it real quick, but do you get the full understanding of the actual covenant that was laid out between they, uh, God and David? Reading verse 1, we read, now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people from Israel in Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all these places where I have moved with the people of Israel, did I speak a word of any of the judges to Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And, have, and I have been with you wherever you went, and cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people called Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I anointed judges over my people Israel and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I shall raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and I shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from here before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. You know, David had become a successful leader for God and overcame many of Israel's enemies and restoring the, the presence of God. He built the tabernacle, and that's where the, the call of the temple of God, that's where they went to worship. You know, and God promises David that he would have a son to sit on his throne forever. You know, and through the year, David had many sons. He had um, Solomon, who was the wise. He had many different sons, many different offsprings, but none would ever be the forever king. You know, he didn't know, but later on down the road that Jesus would be the forever king that they were talking about. Because if you read in the Matthew 1 1, that whole begotten section there, you can trace it from all from David all the way to Joseph, which is Jesus' father. So the actual forever king that was placed on the throne, even even says there in, in the text that he will be my son. And that he is reigning forever on the right hand of the Father. You know, that it was God's son, God's king, God's representative that Jesus would deliver his people. 
which he has delivered his people, he continues to deliver his people. As we close, we can look through the Old Testament, and these, old, these covenants are weaved and bring one complete story, and you can actually see the Old Testament as a story, as a history, versus just one book here, or one book there, or this person went to this, this person went to that. It actually has a beginning, middle, and at the very end, at the end of the New Testament with the Revelations. But the five covenants found in the Old Testament are each uh, promise made to God's children. When these promises were made, it sets up the story of God, how, how God will protect his people. You know, the covenant made with Adam is being fulfilled through the Old Testament and even in the New Testament as we read in Romans. You know, God promised Abraham that he'd be the father of many nations and his offspring would be as many as the stars in the skies. You know, we looked up in the sky here recently in the, in the countryside. There's quite a few up there. You know, then there's lots of, lots of generations that God had blessed Abraham with. We read about that in Genesis 26, 4. This promise is being fulfilled even in the David covenant later in the Old Testament. Each promise that God had made to his people in the form of the covenant was used to encourage the next generation. The nation of Israel was God's chosen people and his promises helped Israel hold on to the hope for the ultimate salvation. If you even look into the New Testament, that they were saying that their father, Abraham, was mentioned multiple times. And how they led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery. And that's what they're thinking Jesus was going to do when he'd come. Well, he come, he to save his people, but not in the way that they were hoping for. But I want to thank y'all for allowing me to present another lesson to y'all tonight. And I hope that we try to learn something or have a go on that we continue not just to throw the Old Testament off to the side of it. There is a lot of meat and potatoes, per se, in the Old Testament. Thank you.